2000 for 2019, making tourism the state's third largest private sector employer. With the governor's commitment and the state's incredible assets, this administration has helped fuel a growth market. Looking at the hotel business, we know that's a bellwether for the entire sector because hotel stays tend to lead to restaurants and visitation. We have seen increases in the total number of available rooms, increases in the occupancy rate of those rooms, and increases in the average price paid per room. We are on that exquisite edge of generating both more supply and more demand. So the track record is amazing, but today New York State's tourism industry is facing unprecedented challenges. For 2020, we are anticipating a 50% decline in visitors to New York State. Recognizing there are some fairly wide variations between regions, but this is going to impact tax revenue, economic impact, and jobs. In fact, for the first few months of the pandemic, the leisure and hospitality industry lost approximately 586,000 jobs. And while we have recovered roughly 309,000, or slightly more than half, the Department of Labor data through mid-November indicates nearly 200,000 industry workers are active beneficiaries of unemployment programs. The decline in hospitality-related jobs is also affecting other industry sectors, particularly in arts and entertainment and cultural institutions, where we are also seeing significant job losses. You may be aware that large companies are required to report impending layoffs to the Department of Labor. Over the past nine months, of the top 10 company layoffs, over half were tourism-related companies. However, there are some bright spots. First off, the tourism industry has shown great innovation. They have reimagined their offerings through virtual reality applications and other digital media to allow visitors to experience attractions from home or outdoors. This helped keep otherwise closed attractions top of mind and allowed many destinations to reach a wider audience who may not have been previously familiar with these attractions. And there are lots of great examples like the Metropolitan Opera, Broadway theaters, and others regularly streaming archival footage from past performances. The National Baseball Hall of Fame had a virtual tour of some, tour of some of their most historic artifacts. Zoos and aquariums have created new virtual and educational content, including my favorite, live animal camps. We've seen interactive live webcasts from standout attractions like the Strong Museum and the National Comedy Center in Jamestown, and unique outdoor experiences like a drive-in live opera performance by the Phoenicia International Festival of the Voice, drive-through safaris at a number of upstate animal parks, and of course, broad-scale rebirth of the drive-in movie theater experience. Our marketing and tourism teams have been actively promoting these events to the 4 million annual visitors to ilovenewyork.com and our 2 million followers on I Love New York social media challenge channel. We've also been promoting staycations and virtual experiences to the travel press and have had great coverage in publications like Travel and Leisure, USA Today, Bodars, Condé Nast Traveler, and the Weather Channel. Of course, we are also tracking how New York State fares as a destination choice relative to our competitive set of other destinations. And the top two box consideration of New York State as a vacation destination, what that means is the number of people who say, I will definitely or probably consider New York State for my vacation, is now at 85%. It's up from 81% last year and the highest of any destination in the Northeast. In recent conversations, our industry partners saw areas of resilience and potentially opportunities for future growth, including a noticeable number of new first-time visitors to more rural outdoor recreation-based destinations by travelers within a two to three hour drive of that destination. We've seen a big uptick in camping with a lot of first-time visitors who have rebooked for next summer. We have increased online booking and advanced res reservations a practice that is expected to continue even after the pandemic, and local residents rediscovering destinations in their own communities while virtual content is creating visibility in markets further away. From a consumer standpoint, the travel forecast is optimistic and positive. 
We are tracking a national sample to understand current and future travel intent. Among frequent travelers, the vast majority plan to resume the same level of travel in the post-COVID era. 92% say they have missed travel very much or somewhat. And 79% are hoping to take a leisure trip in the next six months, indicating that there's a considerable pent-up demand and enthusiasm for traveling again. Among this group of hopeful travelers, 40% have already made some sort of commitment to travel. They booked a hotel or a flight, a rental car, or maybe a vacation package. 60% have not made any sort of commitment, and those are the people we are going to be looking for to bring some of them to New York. Most important, the broad standard to travel in this pandemic is a sense that it is safe and there are no quarantining requirements. And I think we all know that New York State is probably the safest place in the country to be. Bottom line, there's a lot of pent up demand to travel, but it won't turn overnight. So today we're in the midst of a very vulnerable period for the tourism industry. Do we expect it will come back? Definitely. Let's remember there is no place like New York State, there is no place in the world, nowhere, that can lay claim to Niagara Falls, the Baseball Hall of Fame, the Statue of Liberty, the Chautauqua Institute, or a small mountain village that has hosted two Winter Olympics. Our beaches are considered the world's best, our parks unparalleled, and we expect one day soon, we will again be the global center of entertainment and cultural events. So we have every reason to believe we will build back better because we have a highly innovative tourism industry, incredible natural assets, the world's most compelling attractions, and believe we will benefit from consumers' pent-up demand for great experiences. Moving forward, we are working with our regional tourism partners, industry groups, and other stakeholders to ensure we identify the optimal efforts, timing, and focus to rebuild our tourism industry to the levels we have consistently enjoyed under our governor's administration. Thank you. Any questions? Richard, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go first. Just, um, I'm just curious, I assume that there's some thought, you know, arguably, you know, everything always feels um, a, a premature given the world we're living in because it seems like we start something and then the finish line is always pushed back, but uh, you know, given given the state of the vaccine and given the, the state of what I hope is the recovery, I assume you guys are beginning to think through um, what kind of ad campaign and what kind of assistance we should be giving as the world opens up? We are absolutely doing that, Steve. That is correct. It's very much of a work in progress, but we are optimistic to have something um, in the not too distant future, particularly in advance of the summer um, tourism season. You know, it, it might make sense when you're ready. And again, I, you know, I, I recognize because I think everybody on this call has lived through um, preparing things you're about to proceed and then recognizing that the world isn't ready for it yet and pulling it back. But w when you think it's appropriate, I think it would be great if you could give the board a briefing on what that's going to look like. We'd be delighted. Any other questions? Uh, just a, uh, a quick, this is Cesar Perales, just a quick <laughs> um, I presume there are assumptions being made about uh, plane travel uh, and that type of thing. I'm, I'm curious just what assumptions you are making about the impact of the vaccine and when you think uh, folks will begin to travel again? And will it be by the summer, before the summer, or past the summer? Just what assumptions are, are being made about um, tourism in New York? Yes, uh, no, that's a great question. And you know, ev everybody has a different um, view of how quickly it will recover. I think the consensus has been that it will start to recover as the vaccine becomes um, more broadly available. So it will shift over time. The research that we are tracking about consumers' willingness to travel suggests that the vaccine is not the be all and end all for those travel decisions, rather the sense that it is safe to travel, which is a 
personal experience. So we expect different people will feel more comfortable as time goes on. But as I mentioned, 40% of the people who are frequent travelers and who continue, who plan to continue traveling have already made a commitment to travel in the next six months. So we think that's a, a pretty good sign. Okay. Thank you. I don't, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. First of all, Rich, thank you for, for that presentation. Um, and I think you're right, as we've talked about, it's both the reality of safety and the perception of safety before people start to travel. I just wanted to, though, on, on a separate note, point out that, um, uh, and as, as Rich mentioned in, in his briefing, you know, we literally lost or, you know, half, half the tourism industry um, those working industry, you know, were on unemployment at some point. So 500,000, uh, several hundred thousand of those individuals are back to work in, you know, in some way, shape or form. There's still 200,000 people who are receiving unemployment benefits, which, you know, is uh, heartbreaking and, um, you know, is re reinforcing for our agency the work that we still need to do in terms of helping, you know, the overall macro economy. Uh, recover and certainly many of those jobs will um, will come back to work, or you know come back once the tourism industry is in full blossom, so to speak. But um, there's still a ways to go. So I just wanted to make that point. And again, Rich, thank you for that uh, terrific presentation. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Rich. I uh, look forward to hearing more about this in the coming months. Uh, Linda, you had something, Superintendent. Mr. Chairman. Um... Thank you for that report. I think it was uh, very illuminating with respect to the impact of the pandemic. Um, the fact that people want to travel in the next six months, I think there's a difference between traveling in a month and traveling in six months um, with respect to sort of the unknown, unknowable about exactly when places of accommodation entertainment and so forth are in a position to uh, handle larger amounts of people. Um, I think I just want to say a couple of things. One, I concur with what Steve said, and then I would actually make that point more broadly, which I was, would love to hear on another occasion, some kind of briefing about what is our strategic plan forward looking are we doing a heat map about where the impact is, which communities are hardest hit? We all know the pandemic has disproportionately affected communities of color. How does that factor play into the impact here? And will our efforts be strategically targeted to, and is it possible to, to bring relief to the communities you know, most affected on some kind of priority basis, if that's appropriate? Um, I just think, I know you weren't saying this, Rich, but we don't wanna unduly rely on people are excited to come back, right? We wanna have a strategy to harness that energy. And, uh, you know, my concern is gonna take more months than people think for um, the places folks go when they're tourists here uh, to be sort of wide open and the damage may go on longer than we anticipate. I trust and I hope, and if not, I hope you're fully you know, tapped in with the Department of Health or the folks in the chamber about what the expectation is about when we start reaching levels of vaccination, what that means about reopenings. And if those are not known now to do it on a forward going basis, because as you describe the economic harm here, and we're talking about people's jobs and dignity and ability to contribute and the health of the economy, uh, it's the harm to this is just uh, terrible. And whatever we can do during this down period to think it through and be strategic and be prepared and get all the best ideas from the private sector, from the REDCs, from leaders in communities, including communities of color, I think you know, we'll be in a position to contribute and leverage out as much as humanly possible. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much. And again, thank you, Rich. Look forward to talking um, a lot more in the, in the coming year and appreciate your time and insight into this. 
Um, Thank you. With that, uh, before we proceed with our project items, I'll ask Glenn McClary, ESD's Vice President and Director of Loans and Grants, to present a summary of those projects. Glenn? Good morning, and uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, the directors will be requested to consider 12 projects, totaling $9,965,700 in grants. The project includes five regional council awards and seven discretionary awards. The project will take place in the central New York, western New York, Finger Lakes, New York City, and Southern Tier regions, leverage over $62 million of additional investment, retain 350 jobs, and create 34 jobs in the state. Thank you. Thank you. With that, let's, um, let's move now to the project section of today's agenda. Um, regional directors and program staff are, I hope, on the line um, with us today to present their items and to answer any related questions. Uh, we begin with Jim Fail, who has two projects from our central New York region. Jim, are you there? I am. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, the, first, the first project, um, the directors are being asked to approve a 965,000 capital grant to Loretto Independent Living Services, DBA Pace, Central New York. This project is a $3.87 million project that was to construct uh, approximately a 30,000 square foot bus storage and maintenance facility. The project was to create uh, 34 jobs and has already exceeded that. Um, PACE, uh, among other services, provides transportation needs to uh, people that are over 55 uh, to go to places like doctor's offices, day facilities, things like that. Uh, this project was a round seven priority project uh, for the regional wow. council and completed in February of 2020. The next project is actually a revisit of a project that was approved by the board back in October 15th. The uh, project involved the construction of two turf baseball fields, um, utilities, uh, parking area, et cetera, uh, to support local and regional baseball tournaments. ESD had provided $862,000 in a grant on a $4.5 million project. During the public hearing comment period, ESD received uh, four comments, and um, we just are bringing this back to the board so that you are aware of this. Uh, the first comment involved whether um, ESD uh, funds would be used for the construction of a maintenance building, and our funds would not be used for that. The second uh, involved um, having to purchase 2.5 acres of adjacent, adjacent uh, land. Uh, the town did not have to purchase any additional acreage for this project. Uh, and then there was a, a few comments uh, specifically towards the county regarding, or the town regarding how this would um, financially impact uh, the, and benefit the people of Cortland, um, you know, and asked for the uh, county to do a cost benefit analysis. Uh, and those uh, comments were passed along to the town and county for them to address. So what we're asking the directors to do is uh, to affirm the findings and determinations related to the project made pursuant to the New York State Urban Development Corp Act and to affirm the general project plan presented at the October 15th board meeting. And I will take any questions. Any questions? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion with respect to item 2A and 2B on today's agenda. I move it. Motion. Second. Move the second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? The, the motion carries with respect to both of the items. And we now turn to Amanda Mays, who will present two items from our Western New York region. Amanda, are you there? I'm here, good morning. Please proceed. Um, the first item the directors are requested to approve is a grant of $1.2 million from the Regional Council Capital Fund, which is CFA Round 8, to Hotman Woodward Medical Research Institute for a portion of costs associated with a $4.3 million project 
to create the HWI Cryo-Electron Microscopy Center. The project, which will be completed this month, involves the retrofit of 5,000 square feet of space at HWI's facility on the Buffalo Niagara Medical Campus, as well as installation of an electron microscope and other related equipment. Once operational, the center will accelerate drug discovery and treatment of disease by offering a comprehensive set of capabilities centered around the cryo-M technology. Specifically, the center will be doing work for pharmaceutical organizations as well as regional academic and nonprofit institutions. Cryo-electron microscopy has helped in understanding viruses and how they affect the human body as evidenced by the development of vaccines for both Zika and COVID-19 because of this rapidly developing technology. The center will be utilized by a broad range of research groups with aims at cures for cancer, developing therapeutics for age-related diseases such as Alzheimer's, and countless other conditions affecting human health and quality of life. The addition of a cryo-M center in the region will be an important and dynamic advancement for numerous medical and research in the greater Buffalo and Rochester areas. Cryo-M is a transformational technology in life sciences, and prior to this project, access in the Western New York area was lacking. Having cryo-M in the region will help top research scientists and also permits proprietary access for small, medium, and large biotech companies to maximize this new research resource. The center is poised to attract intellectual and financial capital that will expand the growing Western New York biotech ecosystem. The second project, uh, the directors are requested to approve a grant of $600,000 from the Regional Council Capital Fund, which is CFA Round 6, to the City of Buffalo for a portion of costs associated with an $8 million project to reconstruct Allen Street and provide streetscape and infrastructure enhancements. The project was conducted to improve traffic flow and provide connectivity on Allen Street between Main Street and Delaware Avenue in Buffalo and focus on improvements to the street pavement, curb reconstruction, increased pedestrian amenities and signage and wayfinding elements. This infrastructure project addressed deficiencies in the neighborhood that included a lack of ADA compliant sidewalks and crossings, poor lighting, hazardous pavements and lack of safe pedestrian and bicycle features. The project allows better connectivity between the Buffalo and Agro Medical Campus and the neighborhoods to the west of the campus, including with a key commercial corridor. It makes the area more attractive and safer for business and residential use, as well as provides new public art and visual amenities. The project is consistent with the West New York Regional Council strategy to improve placemaking, revitalize the downtown core, to expand business and residential opportunities, and promote smart growth. Any questions with respect to either of these two items? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I did, I've got a, um, a question that doesn't go directly at these two projects, but uh, we've had a presentation of about, uh, I think four projects so far. And uh, I used to hear from the presenter or read from the documents prepared uh, that jobs were being created, that we would see a, economic benefit from the uh, I wonder if we could ask staff to um, include in the description of these projects, the, the economic benefit to the state. Uh, I understand it's not always gonna be the number of jobs, but um, we ought to have a sense that uh, this is advancing um, the economy of our state in some fashion. Um, I, I think that's a great idea. And, and, you know, for perspective here, let me just make sure that either Eric or, or, or Howard don't want to, you know, add something here, given that they have been um, dealing with this in greater depth for a greater period of time than I have. I mean, it's Howard, I would, yeah. you know, I think that's, you know, that's, of course, uh, we're, we're looking to do projects that advance the economy. Um, it's, there are some projects that it's much easier to identify exactly how many jobs are created. And then there's other projects where uh, it's not as scientific when we're trying to, you know, improve the upgrade, you know, accessibility to the waterfront or improve downtowns or, you know, create places that, young, you know, that people young and old want to, you know, stay and invest in. So, you know, we many of the projects that are very job oriented or what we call Excelsior tax credit projects that we do all the time, those don't come to the board. Many of the other projects um, that come to the board, um, you know, revolve around some of our strategies around 
you know, workforce development or place-based investments, um, you know, innovation, you know, when, when Amanda talks about investing in the medical campus and some of these new technologies, you really, the goal of there obviously is to have spinoff businesses, but all the Excelsior tax credits that we do that are very, very specifically tied to jobs and private industry aren't part of our board agendas. Um, and so it appears that, well, some of these projects aren't specifically tied to jobs, but the tax credits that we offer are very much tied to jobs. And that's where a lot of our economic development happens more uh, directly. I was gonna say, I was just gonna reiterate that and, and, and talk about um, you know, the overall ESD strategy and, and, uh, and Howard, you know, made reference to that. I mean, there are, you know, different, um, you know, different parts of our, you know, our strategy, but as, as Howard pointed out, it's not just jobs, although jobs are, you know, critical and we want to make sure that we're measuring a job, certainly with, uh, you know, those, uh, Excelsior tax credits, uh, we do it. Um, but, when we think about our investment strategy, we are looking at, you know, placemaking so that we are building environments that uh, emphasize, um, you know, attractive areas that become job centers. We're certainly looking at workforce as well, which is, uh, you know, our targeted job training and education that allows us to have higher uh, paying jobs. Uh, we look at, you know, certainly innovation that sparks the entrepreneurship and uh, the new companies uh, of, of the future um, here in New York State. And then also um, looking at, you know, the tradable sectors, those that are sort of ex export-based that um, add to a higher multiplier effect in, um, in the economy. So certainly uh, focused on jobs, but making sure that we're fulfilling the four pil pillars of our overall ESD strategy. And, so, and, well, let me just say something. Howard, I, I think you know that I'm totally committed to placemaking and the downtown revitalization initiative. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that, the, and maybe it's because I'm getting older and less uh, stooped uh, as every day goes by, but uh, <laughs> if somebody could spell out for me, uh, for example, how uh, a particular investment is going to make a community more attractive. M maybe spell it out more clearly for me. Yeah. Uh, th that's all I'm suggesting. Sure. Okay. And there was another exact, that's fair for sure, of course. Um, and, and and as you know, if, for, if people don't know uh, on the board, Cesar was instrumental, frankly, in um, you know, the, the state's focus on downtown revitalization. So, you know, I, I do wanna say that that's been so important for upstate and for the revitalization of all of these upstate cities that, you know, really had so much disinvestment for so long but there are, you know, and the governor's had a lot of initiatives around, um, you know, accessibility to jobs for um, underrepresented populations. And so when you see a community say, we want to invest in bus transportation, it's not just to create a more comfortable place for somebody to sit and wait for a bus. It's to give people an opportunity to get to jobs. Um, you know, it's, we, we've had so much sprawl in these upstate cities and so much disinvestment in downtown. Well, what's one of the, you know, really negative impacts of that is it's very hard if you don't have a car and you're based in the city to get to work somewhere out in the suburbs where a lot of the sprawl happened. So, you know, there's a, a clear connection to trying to, um, enhance public transportation and enhance people's access to jobs. Many of those people are underrepresented and are poor. And, you know, there's this whole network that's interconnected around downtown revitalization, workforce training, place-based investment, investing in tradable sectors. It all has to work together uh, and has to be grounded in that philosophy, um, which I think we do but sometimes it's easy to forget, you know, exactly how does this specific project tie into that? And um, so I think those are good points and we should spell it out because I think it's a, it's a good strategy and we've done it well. 
Um, but it's always good to reinforce why and what it is that we're doing. I also, I also want to point out and, and I, you know, applaud, uh, you know, Howard and, and Cesar, you know, for the DRA initiative, DRI initiatives, which have been critical um, around the state. You know, when you think about how jobs are training, uh, how jobs are ch changing and the types of jobs that are growing, um, not just in New York state around the country, you know, you've got a lot of the, um, you, you know, new employees, the, the youth that want to be, not just want to be in downtown areas and cities, but that's really where the new jobs are. And so to be able to attract young people who want to be in, you know, technology jobs or some of the knowledge-based jobs that really require collaboration, those are being done in downtown, downtown areas and in, and in cities. And that's been a big change that's gone on over the last 25 or 30 years. And so I think that there, there is a connection when you're making these places um, not just accessible for the jobs, but attractive so that we, we bring the next generation of talent to these places and spur the types of, of companies that will be the future uh, big companies in, um, in New York state. So as Howard said, um, there is a connection with, you know, with, with, with all of this. Thank you. Right. With, with, with that note, um, I think we're prepared to vote on item 2C and 2D if there is a motion. So moved. I, oh. Seconded. Right. right. I'm all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The motion carries uh, for both items. And we now move to Vinny Esposito uh, for an item from our Finger Lakes region. If any, uh, if you're available and you can proceed. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, directors. One item for you this month, <clears throat> we're asking you to approve a $400,000 capital grant to Nazareth College from the Regional Council Capital Fund and CFA Round 8 to support the creation of a new 125,000 square foot training facility called the Galasano Training Center on Nazareth College campus. Uh, the new multi-use facility supports <clears throat> a variety of college athletic and wellness programming but also as community partnerships, including a new inclusive design that allows for this to be the home of the Special Olympics of Greater Rochester. The project was $2.39 million in total, was completed last October. And to Director Perales' question, I think in addition to leveraging the investment at one of our higher education institutions, it was really the community partnership and the inclusive nature of it that was the Regional Council's reason for designating it a priority project. Be happy to take any questions. Any questions? If not, um, I'll entertain a motion. So yeah. moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? Item 2E carries. Thank you, Vinny. And we now move to Joe Tazewell uh, with two items from the New York City region. Joe, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. The directors are requested to approve a $437,000 grant from the Downtown Revitalization Initiative, which in 2017 targeted the Bronx Civic Center to be used for a portion of the cost of creating a point-to-multipoint rooftop-based wireless broadband network serving residents, businesses, and visitors in the Melrose Commons, a 30-block affordable housing area in the Bronx. The grantee will be We Stay Noscadamus, a nonprofit organization that owns and operates housing and provides community development services in Melrose Commons. Noscadamus will be partnering with Nitour, a Bronx-based internet services provider, to purchase and install network equipment and base towers on five building rooftops that can be accessed by receivers throughout buildings managed by Noscadamus and other partners. The project cost is approximately $558,000. The new broadband network will offer free Wi-Fi in and around select public spaces, including plazas, parks, and community gardens for use by an estimated 25,000 residents annually. In addition, 7,000 residents within the network buildings will have free internet access and will also have op the option to purchase high-speed internet access for $20 per month for services. Typically, this service would cost at least $50 per month. 
According to the New York City Internet Master Plan, the Bronx has the lowest broadband adoption rates of any borough, which is largely due to the problem of affordability. Internet use is foundational to economic mobility, but current broadband subscription costs can impose a considerable burden on the budgets of low-income families. As we've seen over the last nine months, expanding broadband adoption in New York City is even more critical now that remote learning will continue to be a major major component of the public education system. The increased use of telehealth to manage healthcare services through digital information and communication, and the need for small businesses to have an online presence. In addition, the adoption of broadband is now considered essential for the 21st century workforce and will be increasingly necessary to close the skills gap. This project has recently started and is expected to be completed in May 2021. Uh, The next item, the directs is a request to to approve a $500,000 grant for the New York City Department of Small Business Services. The grant awarded in Regional Council Initiative Round 2 will be used in connection with the restoration of 54 acres of degraded wetlands on Staten Island's west shore as well as the creation of the Sawmill Creek Wetland Pilot Mitigation Bank. The Mitigation Bank is a first-of-its-kind program in New York City and is being administered by the New York City Economic Development Corporation. The project, which has a cost of approximately $14 million, was designated by the New York City REDC as a priority in 2012. Mitigation banking involves a system of credits designed to ensure that ecological loss from various development projects is compensated by the preservation and restoration of wetlands, natural habitats, and streams in other areas so that no net loss to so that there is no net loss to the environment. In a dense urban environment like New York City, finding acceptable sites for individual projects to offset construction impacts is difficult and can add years to construction and permitting. The revenues through the sale of mitigation credits are used to reimburse construction costs, perform monitoring, maintenance, and long-term stewardship of the restoration site. The ESC grant will be used for a portion of of the cost of restoring the Sawmill Creek wetland located in Staten Island. The mitigation bank is estimated to generate approximately 13 wetland offset, offset credits, of which 40 have been released or under or are under final review for release. The restoration project was completed in 2019, and the New York City EDC will continue to accept applications for the credits through the summer of 2021. Thank you. Any questions with respect to either of these two items? I, I just wanted to say, you know, Cesar, this is an, you know, another example to your, you know, your question. I mean, you know, here is where you can't sort of lay fiber, but you're doing point to point, you know, high speed access, which obviously helps the community, helps small businesses provide the needed access in an area that is, you know, highly disadvantaged. Um, you know, that's a case where we know that'll spur, you know, better livability and, and ultimately more, you know, more jobs. Eric, I love the Bronx Project. <laughs> they don't need to sell Amen. it. Amen. <laughs> um, no other questions. Uh, is there a motion? Motion. I, I move it. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, item 2F and 2G carry. Joe, before you hop off, Could you do me a favor? And I I had meant to call you about this before. Um, Would you connect with Kate Harris? Um, Although she's from the governor's office, she is actually um, sitting, uh, if we were in the office, she I think is a few doors down from you. Um, But talk to her because she is working with the Schmidt Commission on a broadband initiative. And I think it would be good just to, to make sure that all the pieces are connected here. Sure, happy to do that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move to uh, Donna Howell, uh, two items from the Southern Tier. Donna, are you there? I am here. Good morning. Um, please proceed. Uh, great. So we have two projects from the Southern Tier uh, this morning. The first um, is in Watkins Glen. We're requesting approval 
for a grant of up to two million five hundred thousand for a portion of the cost to construct and renovate a new regional advanced technology wastewater treatment plant, um, which will better support the residents um, as well as the tourism um, activities in Watkins Glen and the surrounding area. Um, the former wastewater treatment plant was actually located right in the middle of downtown Watkins Glen on that Lake Seneca waterfront right in downtown. Um, and so we're removing it from that location to nearby Montour Falls, um, which will open up this site for uh, further development and public use. Um, which is uh, and it's in a DRI community in, in Den Watkins Glen. Um, so this site is located within the 10 mile radius of the former Camp Monterey incarceration facility. So it was eligible for the 2014 economic transformation grant uh, to help offset the economic impacts of the closure of that facility in July of 2014. Um, and to speak to the earlier question, um, it is consistent with the Regional Economic Development Council's strategic plan to promote the region's innovative culture um, under their second goal of strengthening the region's tourism and community assets. Um, and it also supports the state strategy of placemaking uh, by improving the Watkins Glen downtown, um, again, a DRI community, and it will be complete uh, this January 2021. The second project is in Binghamton. Um, we're requesting a grant of up to 500000 for the cost of construction, renovation site work, as well as purchase of furniture, fixtures, and equipment for a vacant and highly distressed property in downtown Binghamton. Um, this, restoring this building to productive use will stabilize a distressed area by removing an eyesore. This is a, a very large building. Um, and recapturing the value of this underutilized neighborhood. And it's also gonna be creating market rate apartments to provide quality housing for the area's workforce. Um, the investment in this historic renovation will also act as a multiplier for concurrent investments in the neighborhood by public and private entities in the area and contribute to the revitalization of the neighborhood. Um, it was supported by the Upstate Revitalization Initiative's Greater Binghamton Fund. Um, and it's consistent, um, again, to the earlier question of, uh, with the Southern Tier Regional Economic Development Council's plan to build the Greater Binghamton ecosystem and the state strategy of placemaking because it's part of the urban core uh, and what is recognized as Binghamton's quote-unquote innovation district, which is their main downtown area. Um, and it will be complete in June 2021. And I'm happy to take any questions. Questions? If not, I will entertain a motion to approve both items. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motions carry uh, with respect to item 2H and 2I. And we turn now to, to Simone, if you're on the phone with, uh, with um, two community uh, capital grant items or a community capital grant item, or a series of community capital grant items. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to everyone. Um, today we are seeking director's approval for three Restore New York grants. The first item is a 400,000 round five grant um, to, this, to the village of Avon in the Finger Lakes region. In December of 2017, Avon applied for Restore New York funding to redevelop the 400 seat park theater, which was originally constructed in 1938 and which had been vacant for over 10 years. Achieving the renovation of this blighted structure was a high priority for the Avon community. In 2018, Avon Park Theater LLC purchased the property and installed a new roof, completed facade work, and made significant interior upgrades. The theater has now been completely renovated at a cost of approximately $636,000 and has been made available for a variety of uses, including screening of films, community events, parties, meetings, and musical performances. The space is expected to be operational in early 2021. The second item is a $700,000 around five Restore New York grant to the city of Oneida in the central New York region for demolition and rehabilitation of three vacant mixed use buildings, which are located in Oneida's downtown historic district. The project, which is estimated to begin demolition in December, 2020 and complete in September, 2021, will create eight market rate apartments totaling 1,600 square feet on the second and third floors. The first floor will also be rehabilitated for 3,000 
220 square feet of commercial space. The project will significantly increase opportunities for downtown living, resulting in new opportunities for walkable downtown activities, demand for new business, commercial, professional, and civic organizations. The city estimates an investment of $2.3 million to complete the work. Um, the third item is a $901,700 round five grant to the city of Corning in the Southern Tier. Corning will partner with Corning Main Street Properties to LLC to redevelop a local landmark and transform it into a mixed use building, which will include seven apartments and two office spaces, along with associated parking for the site. The project building was designated as a landmark under the city's 2014 strategic housing plan. Because the plan called for the continued redevelopment of market rate, market rate housing, the building was an ideal location for the development. The project is expected to be complete this month at a cost of approximately $1.7 million. And I can take any questions. Any questions? If not, I will entertain. So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? Motion carries with respect to all three items. And we now move to Luke Severe for an item uh, which relates to the New York State MWBE Business Certification Assistance Program. Luke, are you there? Yes, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. <clears throat> good morning, everyone, and happy holidays. The Division of Minority and Women-Owned Business Development is requesting the directors to one, make a determination of responsibility with respect to the proposed contractors. Two, to authorize the corporation to enter into a contract with R6 Catalyst, LLC, not to exceed $500,000. <clears> Hofstra <throat> University Entrepreneurial Assistance Center, not to exceed $500,000. And three, to authorize the president and chief executive officer designate of the corporation or his designee to take such action and execute such documents as may be necessary or appropriate to carry out the requested actions. SuperCap, a super a certification assistance program, is a quality assurance process to support applicants with collecting the supporting documents needed to submit their MWB applications, and it reduces the time period for review and approving applications. The process allows the division to expand its certification program to include more MWBEs and promote greater equity in state contracting. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? If there are none, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? The motion carries. We now move to Vincent Ravich here. Uh, with an item uh, that relates to the New York State Electric Generation Facility Cessation Mitigation Program. Vincent, are you there? I am. Thank you, and, uh, and good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, this item does concern the Electric Generating Facility Cessation Mitigation Program. The program was established to offset the loss of property taxes and pilot payments to localities and school districts due to the closure of electric generating facilities within their jurisdictions. Today, the board is being asked to approve a grant for approximately $1,127,963 from the program for the Kenmore Town of Tonawanda Union Free School District. The award will offset the reduction of property tax payments to the school district from NRG Energy due to the, the closure of the Huntley Power Plant in March of 2016. This is the fifth of seven program years for the school district, and the award represents 40% of the district's property tax loss from the plan for this year. Approval of this grant will bring total disbursements from the program fund to approximately $33.6 million. I would be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you. Questions? Then I will entertain a motion. I moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The motion carries. That takes us to Clayton. Are you there? 
Yes, I am. Good morning. Please proceed. Thank you. New York Ventures would like to ask the board to authorize for the New York State Innovation and Venture Capital Fund to co-invest up to $500,000 in Konomics Inc.'s current $6 million Series B round. Konomics is a, it's a technology startup based in Ithaca, New York, and is developing the next generation battery technology that will have higher power density than the current lithium ion batteries at a much lower price. In Q2 of 2018, New York Ventures made its first co-investment in economics of $1.5 million, along with Volta Capital, a venture capital firm that invests in early stage battery companies, and Hegemon Capital. Having met the technology milestones of the Series A investment, the investors are co-investing in this follow-on Series B round. For background, Konomics has a lithium ion battery chemistry licensed from Cornell that when commercialized will replace the current generation of lithium ion batteries in many applications. The chemistry is safer, has higher energy density, and utilizes materials that are much more plentiful and inexpensive than cobalt and nickel. The company has moved from the McGovern Center Accelerator on the Cornell campus to its own R&D production product development facility and is building a team to develop its formation for the production at commercial scale. It currently has nine full-time employees, though the number will grow with this round of financing. Are there any questions? Yeah, it's Eric. Um, what, what, is the, what was the Series A valued at and what is the Series B being valued at? The Series A was uh, $8 million and the Series B B is twenty million dollars. Those are both pre pre money or post money. Pre money, pre money numbers. Yes. Okay, and then I and the assume from what is primarily the the the, uh, the Series A valuation. The tw the, uh, I'm not I'm not sure I understand that. The twenty is this. Oh, I said I'm sorry. So so the uh, series the uh, um, Series uh, A round was uh, uh, pre money was eight million, and then they put in uh, seven million, and then there's a, a bump up from the from that to the twenty. Okay, and then and then this is still uh, you know it's still not at the point. It sounds like that they're generating revenue. They're still doing um, build out of the product itself and the battery. That's correct. Okay. Okay, I'm good. Any other questions? In which case, I will ask uh, if there is a motion. Motion. Uh, second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposition? The motion carries. Uh, we are now off to Kevin Yunus, who will provide a summary of administrative actions on today's agenda. Um, Kevin, you there? Yes, sir. Good right. morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, directors. I have five scintillating administrative items for your consideration this morning. Why did you hear uh, that? I'll run, <laughs> I'll run through all five, and then I'll ask Doug Carr, uh, our VP and Deputy Director of the Moynihan Station Development Corporation, to provide further information on the last item. Uh, the first item is... We, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Kevin, are we going to be voting on the motions or whether or not they were all scintillated? I'm kidding. Uh, you can do both. <laughs> uh, the first item is a request for authorization to enter into a contract with 8x8 for continued support and maintenance of ESD's phone systems. Uh, in 2017, ESD entered to, into a contract with Insight public inc uh, for phone systems and software and other services uh, that is expiring this year insight provided those installation and su support for the 8x8 phone system so esd is now going to contract directly with 8x8 the contract is uh, not to exceed nine hundred and seventy nine thousand dollars the second item is authorization the request for authorization to enter into contract with eftr group CPAs, PLLLC, uh, ESD's independent audit accountants for auditing and related services. Contract term is for three years with two one-year renewal options at a cost of $1,248,000 and is inclusive of a 10% contingency. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, 
EFPR is ESD's incumbent audit firm and was selected through a competitive RFP process. The next item is related to uh, seeking authorization to enter into a contract with ADP Inc. for payroll, human services, and time and attendance services. Contract term is for three years uh, at a cost of uh, $277,500, inclusive of a 10% contingency. ADP has provided those services to ESD for the last several years. Next item is a request to amend a contract with STV Inc. to continue to provide environmental consulting services and cover the costs of services in connection with the environmental impact statements for the Brooklyn Developmental Center Mixed Use Project. The amendment is an increase of about $400,000, including contingency, and will bring the total contract to $1.5 million. The contract will continue to be funded entirely from an impressed account funded by the developer. Final item uh, is a request for ESD to enter into a license agreement with MSG for all marketing and sales of the advertising and promotional displays using ESD owned assets and rights to the Moynihan train hall and other areas of Farley. MSG was selected via an RFP and ESD will pay and will pay ESD a license fee composed of the minimum annual guaranteed amount and an annual share of the net revenue from MSG's marketing and sales using ESD's assets. Uh, and I've asked Doug Carr uh, to provide additional information on this item. Doug? Uh, yes, good morning. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions as it pertains to the last item. Any questions? Uh, and by the way, let me note before I call for a, a motion that I believe, if I'm correct on this, Howard, it is um, item 6B that you are recused from. Correct. Thank you. So with respect to, to uh, these five agenda items, I'll call for a motion understanding that, uh, that uh, Commissioner Zemsky is not voting um, with respect to B. Um, can I have a motion? Motion. motion. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The motions carry. Um, and I will thank you, uh, Kevin and Doug, um, for uh, your work on this. And uh, always nice to see an, another another step forward with respect to Moynihan. Um, I think that uh, that concludes all the business we have uh, today, unless I'm missing something, um, in, in which case I want to wish everybody a happy and healthy holiday. Um, stay warm and I will uh, ask if there's a motion to adjourn. Thank you. I, I second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Um, look forward to seeing Thank you all. Sir. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Happy holidays everyone. Bye. Happy holidays. Yes. Thank you. Bye. 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 Same to everyone.